Good morning, everybody. How's everybody feeling? Everybody wide awake, had their breakfast, got their liquid inspiration, aka coffee in their system. Very good. That was more for me. Um, hope everybody had a wonderful evening last night. Welcome back. Day three of the Health 2.0 Conference. Our final day. And of course, big shout out to our gold sponsors, Inlytic and OutcomeMD for helping make this possible. After two days of learning and networking, we are gonna take it up a notch starting now. We have one more day today filled with you with just amazing panel, keynotes, and everything in between as we have been. So thank you for being here and sticking it out for the remainder. And of course, we will have a couple of our award sessions and recognition programs coming up today as well. So a uh, friendly reminder before we get started, please don't forget to share in your tagging of all your photos. We want to be right there with you. We want to look through all of your photos and, and remember everything with you. So anything that you're posting, whether it's you know an award or maybe meeting a new connection, taking a picture, please be sure to tag us. Hashtag health, the number two, C-O-N-F. On that note, let's get our first panel kicked off. This morning panel features a group of CEOs and founders coming from different verticals of healthcare and wellness sectors. During this discussion, they'll discuss the need to move away from relying on outdated methods of patient care and instead focus on utilizing innovative strategies that will allow us to get ahead of these problems before they even occur. Please put your hands together for the session's moderator, Dr. Jessica Grundler, CEO and founder of Clinical Project Resource, LLC. Come on up, Jessica. Yeah, I'm Tanvir Hassan. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Icon. <clears throat> we have been working in New York for our last uh, almost uh, five years, and uh, we are working with the primary care physicians, the specialists, and also behavioral health counselors. So, also we are trying to make a system where the system can go to our patient-centered value-based care model. So that's why we are uh, consulting for patient-centered medical home, uh, all the primary care physicians. But now, also for the specialists, uh, they are doing the PCSP. That's uh, similar to PCMH. And also, we help the doctors with the right coding, uh, billing, their administrative complexity. So that's what we are doing now. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lance Wright. I work in the addictions field. Um, as I met another friend earlier this morning, I have about almost 30 years of sobriety myself, so there's a passion in the field to help people because someone did it for me many, many years ago. And every day I get to see clients in the field where there's a huge gap between treatment and success, and the success rates are not very nice, for lack of a better word, and we'll get more into that. But I have a company called Life Over Addiction, which basically is treatment doesn't end when treatment ends it needs to continue and people need that support on the other side and there's a discussion that needs to be had and i'm grateful to be at the forefront of that thank you las vegas is a perfect place to uh why you're sober as well. <laughs> <laughs> i remember it yeah <laughs> Yes, yes. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle Shaw, founder and CEO of Compassionate Solutions. We are a healthcare staffing company, um, and we recruit the best nursing healthcare staff in the world. So if you ever have a nurse or a healthcare worker from our company, you'll probably want to keep them. Um, but my passion and our passion is healthcare providers and taking care of them. Um, that is a huge gap, as you can imagine right now, especially in the healthcare feel pre, post, now during the pandemic. Um, so we are focused on securing those nurses, um, going international, and making sure we can have a great succession plan. Thank you very much. And my name is Dr. Jessica Gunner. I have my PhD in nursing. I've been a nurse for 35 years, focused on surgical services and nursing and traumatic quality risk management. One of the opportunities I saw out in the workforce was bringing vendors and healthcare organizations together so they understand how each other work. So I developed a company called Clinical Project Management, and I work with vendors to understand how to align and speak to and educate to the healthcare and hospitals that they need to communicate with. I provide education to their sales team. I work with hospitals on quality risk management and surgical services projects. 
and then branching out as a legal nurse consultant. So Health 2.0 was a perfect way for me to incorporate clinical project resource into two areas, and some of us all have stuck in the marketing sessions, and then we're great. So thank you for taking time today to be here. So what we're going to talk about, um, when I looked at this subject, I, because I still work as a senior director of nursing, my focus was very small, and I was thinking about all of the technology that's available to help hospitalize patients and the reason that it's not being implemented. But as I ventured this week and I read the profiles of our esteemed panel, um, we branched that out to more of a global look at clinical problems and a global look at solutions. So the world's top healthcare concerns are that the healthcare system is overstretched. And to restore the services to some pre-pandemic levels, how do we invest in our workforce to, subvert, to, to um, assure that we have the infrastructure to support that? So Michelle, why don't you start? And I'd like everybody to put on that. Sure, sure, sure. So just let's start out from the student nurse. Um, a lot of programs, and um, actually Lance and I were just talking about this, um, they bridge them in high school. And they have those bridge programs where you can go, you can become a CNA, you can become an MA. Um, you can just kind of pick up whatever trade that you want to pick up. But going there and getting that low-hanging fruit from those students, talking to them, bringing them in as volunteers into the hospital so they can see, they can develop a passion for being at the bedside. It starts from there. Um, then um, let's go into our new grad nurses and, and those programs. So a lot of people are not entering nursing programs right now. So what do we do about that? We have to go internationally, seek out those nurses that already have the experience, help them get over here so that we can support our, our nation really and truly. And some nurses that are already experienced, they wanna go overseas too. So create that bridge program, develop the succession plan, support your middle managers in the field that are working right now. Um, and if your nurses are burnt out, give them the time, give them the PTO, hire more per diem staff so you can support your staff. Right now during the pandemic, um, a lot of nurses have left the bedside and, and you're not gonna get them back. So what are you gonna do about that? You have to work with what you have, really and truly. <coughs> well, I'm not in the nursing field, but I work with a lot of doctors and nurses. There's a very high volume of nurses. In treatment. Different sources. Exactly. Well, yes. Um, for me in the industry, I mean, I know the company I work for one of them specifically, and I won't mention the name because I don't know that that's appropriate, but they um, annually they provide a platform for all the staff to participate and do polls and have conversations with middle and upper management on how to improve services, how to meet their needs, where they feel things are lagging. So there's a conversation with management that in many places I don't know that exists. And I was just talking to I'm going to mispronounce it, but and we were talking about this week. There's been a lot of talk about AI and automation mm -hmm. and all these wonderful gifts that were being given. But what happened to the human connection? <clears throat> what happened to I'm an employee and I don't want to just get an email. I want to be like seen and heard. I want to participate in these things. Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of it is people. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I don't want us to lose people in this conversation because we're the most important commodity in this. Mm -hmm. And so. Mm -hmm. So from my uh, workplace, when I work with the primary care physicians and they have the medical assistants, and now they're also bringing the nurse practitioners and uh, physician assistants on board mm -hmm. because so that they can take care of their patients. Um, so from my understanding, when we work as a PCMH consultant, I think the components NCQA build is very important. Uh, one of the component is a team-based care, right? And then the quality improvement. So all those practices, right now for certifications, the practices are trying to do, but it's very important that the staff to be involved. And even with the minimum number of staff, if you can do the efficient use of time, and efficient use of your resources, that will significantly help because definitely right now in the market, we are in a short of a staff, right? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but even with those staff, how we can make it more efficient. I think uh, there are guidelines from NCQA, and uh, even the involvement, I think it's uh, from, if the guideline is coming from the top down with the primary care physician to the all the staff, it will help them to uh, synchronize their work and work efficiently. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Edward Williams to our panel. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Williams, why don't you introduce yourself and what your company does, and then let's hear what you think about um, the healthcare system being overstretched and what solutions you might have for that. Great. <clears throat> I'm a dentist, and uh, I'm also going to do quite a bit of research in concussion. Mm. Concussion <clears throat> happens to be the world crisis terms of what we have allowed to occur on the field and not only on the field of sports, but in the military, car accidents, no one has ever considered how does a concussive injury get into the base of the brain? Who's doing it? Boxers know if I hit the chin cuff, I get two components of force. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so can I. But we've never considered how the component of force gets into the brain. We've talked about years how the brain has to rotate in the skull for a concussion. How ridiculous is that? We know that the brain is attached to the skull by membranes. If I rotate, what do I do? I tear membranes. Everyone knows how difficult it is to attach a membrane to a bone. So what does a person do that has a concussion? Walk around with his brain doing like that all day? No. We have lost the concept because of that particular uh, concussion um, it's explanation that they've taken in the, at the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s, and we follow that. We've now designed helmets that we want the, to, to people to believe helmets do what? Prevent concussion? Absolutely not. I maintain a helmet on the head by doing what? Putting on the chin strap. I pull that chin strap tight to hold that helmet so it doesn't rotate, rotate off the, the athlete's head. But at the same time, what have I done? I pulled that jaw joint into the base of the skull. So any component of the helmet that I hit, where's that energy going? Into the base of the temporal lobe of the brain. Now we have found that bone in this area fractures. And once that bone fractures, you can go through stress and start clenching. And what do you do? Ag agitate that bone. You agitate that bone and you bring about all the cognitive symptoms of concussions. Mm. We have to change our thinking in looking at concussions. We need nurses. We need people there that begin to understand a new methodology of concussions. How does it happen? We look about, talk about G-forces, like G-force is not an impact. It certainly is an impact to the base of skull. So what we have to do is change our thinking and look at how do we prevent concussions? How do we save the brain? We're talking about the brain of children. They start football and all these sports, soccer, the same thing. I hit any part of the head, this lower jaw is not attached, what happens? This lower jaw slams into the base of the skull. You have hawker people that think the headache is a red badge of courage. It's wrong. We need to stop that, prevent these kind of concussive injuries to the brain, and look forward to a better solution, which we have in terms of preventing concussions. Oh. Thank you. Nice. One of the topics that we discussed this morning is long-term therapy based on evidence-based practice mm -hmm. versus the society's need for instant gratification, mm. especially in computers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. So um, one of the, the, the things that you, the panel made me think about when we're talking about staffing mm. is, and the need for that human connection. Mm -hmm. I do a series of presentations called Back to the Bedside, where as a leader um, in healthcare, I was so burnt out one day mm. and so um, abused or depressed and traumatized from the constant day-to-day -day push to meet my productivity numbers, meet my budget, mm -hmm. um, ask to do things that I didn't feel safe, mm -hmm. that I just walked out of the door without any notice. I, I was put in a position where I felt the safety of the next patient who walked through my doors would be compromised. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I've now learned that it's called, I mean, it's just, I just heard it this year. Mm -hmm. Compassion fatigue? No, um, more Burnout. Burnout. Oh, moral injury. Okay. Um, that over time, thank you. Over time, <laughs> that those 
the things that were asked of me mm -hmm. that compromised my moral mm -hmm. ethics, I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And I walked out of the job as a senior leader in a hospital without any, mm -hmm. um, and I thought my career was over. So I went back to the bedside. Mm -hmm. And I went back to the bedside as a surgical nurse, and I, no one knew who I was. I sat in the lounge for a week. So let me figure out who I was. And I sat in the lounge for weeks and listened mm -hmm. to what the staff were complaining about. Mm -hmm. And it was little changes that just aided them and aided them and aided them. Mm -hmm. And the staff shortages and the requirements to meet productivity numbers. Mm -hmm. Team nursing is a fabulous concept. Mm -hmm. With physicians and nurses and techs and healthcare workers waiting at the bedside and even vendors participating in that to improve the care of a patient. Mm -hmm. But I can't do that as a nursing leader, because I have one RN to six patients, and they're lucky if they have someone answering the phone and someone to help ambulate their patients, bathe their mm -hmm. patients, feed their patients. Mm -hmm. So healthcare organizations are making it very hard mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. that personal approach mm -hmm. and to re-implement team nursing, which was very popular when mm -hmm. I started. Yeah. One of the next discussions we want to talk about when it comes to the world's health concerns <coughs> Um, is mental health concerns. They've risen above cancer as the top concern. So, uh, Lance, let's start with you and then go through the panel on how do you envision closing the gap between mental health needs, which includes addiction, and the lack of services and long term care to address that? Well, one thing's for sure. A lot of the clients that come into addiction treatment or need addiction care have a mental health component. Yes. The comorbidity is evident, and uh, you see it every day. And one of the things is having had ADHD myself, I'm a pretty open book in working with clients, and a lot of times they don't want to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. mm. It's taboo. Something's wrong with me. Something's broken. Mm. And I think inviting them into a conversation and normalizing mental health is just as big a part of this as anything else. Mm -hmm and removing the stigma so that they can get the help they need. Um, also, we know that medication can help with depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. And once a client gets on those medications is under the care of a doctor and a counselor and a treatment team, their success grows exponentially. So, I mean, for me working in the field, I think the care that they get starts with a welcoming conversation and normalizing mental health. As a society, it's still in many ways stigmatized, like addiction. And when we, we can talk about it with guilt, without guilt or shame, good or bad, wrong or right, and just say it's a thing that we need to come together as a family to work on and accept and, and, and love, that change can happen. And I think earlier this week, um, there was a discussion about the institutionalizing of people in mental health during, I think it was the first panel. I wrote a I note on that. Yep. And um, I think that's what created that stigma. And even, you know, what, 70, 85 years later, we're still getting over that stigma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what are your thoughts on closing that gap? a good question. I think that um, a lot of times we have to remember why, what, what is bringing our healthcare workers back? Why are they staying at the bedside? What is intrinsically motivating them to stay here and to be here? And how can we support that? How can we garner their interest? How can we make sure that we are engaging our team? And like Lance was saying, like, you know, you have to get down to the person. So you have to give them the empathy, give them the space to be visionaries. Committees are a great thing to do, and I think just during the pandemic, all of that kind of went to the wayside, and we're just like, okay, we have to take care of our patient. Our focus is our patient. Our focus is our patient. But now, like, the nurses are burnt out. The doctors are burnt out. Even the support staff are burnt out. Are we utilizing that, those flow pools? Are we hiring more CNAs for flow pool? Are we hiring more nurses for flow pool? What are other things that we can do to support our staff? And, and, it's, and sometimes, unfortunately, the manager, it's left up to the manager. I could see how you will walk out of that situation, honestly, um, because it's overwhelming. Like, what, what are you supposed to do? So how are we supporting our middle managers? 
because sometimes they're having to be pulled into the staffing numbers too, so they can't meet their marks and make their numbers. So for me, again, I think that we have to focus on um, supporting our nurses by hiring extra support staff for them so that they're not feeling like everything is on them to do it. And there's more support, there's more teamwork. Team nurses is actually great at one of my hospitals that I um, am a house supervisor at. We put together maybe four um, PCU nurses and a, and a critical care nurse, and they take care of a team together. And, and it works for them. It, it really works for them. Nobody feels burnt out. Nobody feels overwhelmed. It definitely works for them. And of course, I'm going to harp on international nursing mm -hmm. and bringing those nurses here. Because what is our succession plan? There's not enough people entering nursing school. And quite frankly, when I enter nursing school, I'm, I've been a nurse now for 12 years. At that point, before that, it was really hard to get into nursing school. So how can we support that? Um, kind of bending the, not, I don't want to say bending the rules, but associate nurses, bring them back into the fold, bring LPNs back into the hospitals, because you need them. They're getting tired at the nursing homes. We have to find a way to be creative. So similar, how do you take technology to support nurses in this environment to help decrease the burden and positions? Mm. So uh, definitely, as uh, Lance just mentioned, that. We need people behind technology. So technology is very helpful, but when we are talking about health, when it's so personalized, it's so emotional, that it cannot be done totally with technology, right? There has to be, technology has to be assisted by the people. So when we are uh, involving the doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers, technology definitely can automate. And what you just mentioned before, that we cannot automate a bad process, right? I love that, and that's very important, that we definitely need automation, we need the help of technology, and from ICON, when we are working, we feel that importance. Uh, and what we did, that everywhere we see that the nurses, the doctors are burned <coughs> out, right? So our first product we build, we call it Save It, right? So save your time and money. Mm. So at the end of the day, if you can save your time, you can use that time for patient engagement. Or we are talking all those buzzwords that uh, uh, patient engagement, then uh, enhanced care coordination, mm -hmm. lack of uh, uh, care delivery. Mm -hmm. So all those things we can do, but definitely we need a ground preparation before that, right? So for the ground preparing, I think we need to help our healthcare providers. The nurses, as just uh, you mentioned, that you, know, you feel the overwhelm. You mm -hmm. feel like uh, it's not all on me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing when we are bringing the technology, we have to understand that whether the platform or the users are ready to uh, uh, get the best out of the technology or not, right? So that's what I feel like uh, uh, technology can definitely help and even uh, they can automate the data. Especially data takes a lot of time and the doctors are spending a lot of time completing their charts. And I know the doctors that they are working like uh, up to 12 o'clock after mm -hmm. finishing their office mm -hmm. just to completing the charts. And when we talked to the doctors, they told me that uh, uh, it's not helping the patients because I'm writing and completing all these charts. And this is actually more for the peers report, right? Mm -hmm. Reporting to the peers. It's not for the patients. So from there, we felt like uh, then we need to have something for the patients. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's where we brought the, the, our second product is tape. So it's, very, it's a very simple term, save is actually to save time and money, and tape is the tool to accelerate patient engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very simple, the patients, when they will come to the primary care physician, they get connected with the uh, PCPs, they get the subjective care plans, because right now all the care plans are in the EMR. That's mm. not to the patients, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can remember mm -hmm. only 20% of the material the doctors are saying. Mm -hmm. But if you have it, if you have the self, uh, your goals, mm -hmm. your self-management, you understand the potential barrier of your, why you cannot achieve mm -hmm. uh, your goals. Mm -hmm. So all those things when the patients are having in their hand, that will actually activate self-care. Mm. And self-care is health care. That's what like, we are saying. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's, I think. Uh, That'll be our motto of the day, self-care is health care. <laughs> <laughs> so you brought up payers. So um, Dr. Williams, let's have you weigh in on cost is a big gap 
in what may be a problem and a solution. And we'll start with you and then go down the line. So mm -hmm. as a vendor or an entrepreneur, um, how do you close that gap by having a discussion about the cost of a product that may not be reimbursable? What is the ROI? How do you address solutions that um, purchasers feel are expensive or will cost them money, even with a huge benefit to the population? How do you address the closing that gap? I think we as healthcare providers collectively should begin to look at fee for services. You're burning out physicians, nurses, and everyone. Not only are you dropping, they're dropping our fee for services, but they're creating more need that we've got to process. That is the killer to healthcare. We, the, my concept is pay Caesar for what Caesar has done. Hmm. They have taken the payments out of our whole, when I first came into dentistry, they paid me by way of a dollar or a chicken. I didn't have to write out anything, <laughs> but it was a wonderful way to practice. Yeah. Today that has been impaired because nobody is saying, what are these insurances doing besides making money? Making all of our profit right off the top. We have never got together to collectively even talk about that. Mm. Why? Are we scared of insurance payments? Uh, insurance plans? Or are we? Oh, like yeah. we don't like to be paid. <laughs> we have to understand it has to start from the top and trickle down. Yeah. Let's look at what we do in terms of drug abuse. We have seen an escalation in opioid addiction. Mm. I guess I could use the term addiction. Okay. Yes, you may. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what we have not understood. <clears throat> I've got, I treat a lot of athletes who are, I wouldn't call them addicted, mm. dependent. Mm. Okay, so that's, that's a kind of word. And what happens when we scan with technology today, we find fractures here in the base of that bone. When that fracture is healed, the addiction goes away. Mm. If you look at the symptoms of concussions, all of those symptoms, we talk about the rotation, all of the symptoms point to the temporal lobe. No symptom points to the frontal lobe or the occipital parietal lobe. All of them point to the temporal lobe. Where does the lower jaw slam? The base of the temporal lobe. So we have a multiple of problems. And not only, as you said, you got to do all this reporting and not get paid. <laughs> it just takes a whole lot of integrity out of healthcare. We cannot let that happen and let it go forward. So looking at the conversation here, there are ways that we need to do and what we need to do in terms of collectively looking at what is the downfall of healthcare. Why are we not seeing the pipeline filled with more children, sorry, more uh, uh, students in healthcare? Well, it's not attractive. It's not Those are in healthcare are not saying things positively. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the insurance carriers have destroyed us, have destroyed mm -hmm. a part of our brain that we can't get back. And to try, you can't fight, you can't take an insurance company to, to court. You don't have that much time or money left. So what we need to do is look at the problem from the top down. I think a lot of our points that we've talked about here will accelerate to do so much better. Pay Caesar for what Caesar's done. I think this venue, um, Health 2.0, the distinguished panel discussions that all of us have heard this week. Thank you so much for allowing us this venue. What I hear from you is you have a product, and this is just an example of why I think this is brilliant. You have a product that after how long can help that heal to make someone less dependent compared to the lifetime of an addiction because they've been dependent on something to heal their pain when their pain could have been healed in what time? We take a patient on with a fracture. Uh, we do, use a product that takes in that lower jaw out of the impact site. Mm. And in four months, all of that's gone. The bone begins to heal. You can heal bone with tension. So we put them in a tension phase with a unit that we, we place. And in four months, the symptoms are gone and they're off that drug. Wow. So paying for a product for four months can essentially 
keep someone out of the mental health addiction dependency cycle for a lifetime, but we don't look at that as healthcare. No, so let's talk about ROI for IT. How do you work with your physicians and the healthcare organizations that you work with to close the gap between what they see as a cost and how do you um, prove your benefit to them? So when we talk about the ROI, so the product we build save, um, what we are seeing that there are multiple variables here. It's starting from the number of physicians, number of patient panel, what percent of the patients are actually suffering from chronic disease, and what percent of the chronic disease patients have uncontrolled uh, vitals or the uncontrolled uh, situation. And when we look at those patients with the non-compliance, we want to see that with what percent of those patients are, has the intention to improve, right? So they can uh, move from the, uh, the left side of the graph to the right side. So based on all those numbers, when we have a realistic uh, assumption, it's showing that uh, the ROI would be uh, for a 500 patient panel uh, doctor's office with 20% uh, of chronic diseases, it's showing that the, it will save at least $30,000 for the, the practice. And when we talk to the physicians, they significantly they appreciated that because this, when we're saying that it will save your $30,000, there is two components of that. One is direct revenue and another is indirect revenue. When you are saying direct revenue, it's like with the right coding and with tracking the patient's uh, physiologic data, with the right billing, you can generate that amount of money. And at the same time, uh, how much time your practice is saving. So your time is money, right? So how much, if you evaluate your time into money, that comes to a valuation of $10,000, $15,000. So all together, we are seeing that within six months, this is uh, with a 500 patient panel, it's over $30,000. That's incredible. And you're not only focused on the ROI, the patient outcomes Absolutely. have improved. So Lance, we were talking earlier in your practice how um, a patient can enter treatment for 30 days, and there's a big gap in 30 days and 30 years. Mm. And that th treating someone for 30 years who hasn't gone through a process to help handle their addiction costs the economy a fortune. So how do you bridge the gap between your 30-day inpatient or even outpatient service to battle an addiction and having an outcome such as yours? Well, a couple things. I know I really appreciated the doctor down here when you mentioned addiction and the, and, and the numbers. Uh, right now in America, the cost for alcohol and substance abuse is over $300 billion a year. That's like, I got emotional just saying that word. Mm. You know, give us a billion, we'll make changes. I mean, I'm just saying insurance companies, but um, I hear words like evidence-based practices and ROIs, and I, I don't hear the human being in there. And I work in a place that's went from um, a private facility to a corporate facility, and the ROI has began to eat at it. And I see it every day, and I hear staff talk about it and it's impacting the work and the caseloads and yes. all the other things that go with the company and creating stress. But for me, how do I help a client have a fulfilling life? Really, I think that's all of our jobs at the end of the day. And to take somebody that's been using or a substance or alcohol or other behavioral addiction, whether it's a narrative or other, and give them 30 or 60 days to kind of regain their homeostasis or balance in their life and then say good luck here's a therapist and here's an aa meeting i'm not saying a i believe AA can help people i believe a th i'm strongly for therapy for clients when they leave treatment but it's one part there's a big part and a big gap missing is counseling and coaching and mentoring with somebody with a background and a specialty to help that person move from I'll use Michelle. Michelle comes, I hear Michelle's leaving treatment. She's never really lived a healthy life in 10 years. Mm -hmm. I come on board with Michelle, meet with her, set a plan for her life so when she leaves treatment, I'm the training wheels for her on the other end. Mm -hmm. Right now in this treatment world, we hear buzzwords like, well, when my clients leave treatment, we have an 80% success rate. Well, 
yeah, while they're in treatment, let's talk about <laughs> recidivism. Right now in the best treatment centers, and I'm probably given an extreme number, success rate is maybe 15%. And I'm three to five years is long-term sobriety in my consideration. That's not mm. ethical. Mm. And so how can we improve that gap? That's what Life Over Addiction, the company that I'm founding and growing is about. We need to help those people build a life beyond treatment. Treatment doesn't end when treatment ends. And so for me, I don't know the costs, but I know the lives. And it's not just the life of the person that's healing from active alcohol or substance abuse or other behavioral addictions. It's the cost of the communities. It's the cost of the family. It's the cost to the spirit of their community. And that cost goes way beyond money. And the insurance companies have, it's like people are numbers. Mm. And when we're in that kind of space, who are we as a people? And I see people dying every day, fentanyl rates, deaths, mm -hmm. you mentioned opiates. Mm -hmm. In 2013 and 2014, the average annual rate of death for opiate overdoses was around 2,000. Mm -hmm. Currently, that stands at about 95,000 annually mm -hmm. and going up. Um, I see that in families, the impact on families and, and, and other people every day. So it's, it's, again, it's not a fancy slogan, it's people. And so if we can help them, just in helping people, we save money. Yeah, absolutely. So that's my part and my passion in being on this panel. I appreciate everybody sharing what they've shared. And that's an extremely um, important purpose and path in life. Um, one of the hospitals that I work at in San Francisco is in the Tenderloin mm -hmm. of San Francisco. And if, none, if you have seen it on TV, you can't even imagine the trauma that you see when you drive down the street in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. There are hundreds of mental health patients or drug and alcohol addicted patients who are sleeping on the streets, defecating on the streets, using on the streets. And what concerns me is not how it has defaced San Francisco. It's why can't we help these people? Why couldn't we help these people um, after they got out of treatment? How did they get here? And I know a lot of them are veterans, and I know a lot of them are people who, when the pandemic started, couldn't get the mental health treatment that they needed or don't know where to go. So thank you very much for that being your passion. I see it every single day. Yes. I will tell you, though, if somebody comes in the ER with an opioid overdose and you shoot them in the chest with epi, they will wake up and say, you ruined my high, yeah. not yes. thank you for saving yeah. my life. That is how important that yeah. high is yes. for them. Yeah. Michelle, yeah. let's go to you and have you talk to us about how international nursing mm -hmm. might bridge the gap in the healthcare crisis. Sure, sure, sure. So I'm glad that you mentioned that, but first I wanna start off by saying a new grad nurse to train and orient them costs about sixty to $80,000. You can lock them in maybe for a year with the sign-on bonus, um, but after that year, they're gone to the staffing world to go and travel and live their best life. And um, that is a trend right now. So for international nurses, giving them the opportunity just to be here in the U.S. and learn a new skill set, um, learn some new technology, um, garner themselves, and even maybe stay here to take their talents back to their country so they can improve on their country. Um, you can lock an international nurse in for at least three years. So at least you have the right succession plan there in place, and then market them from there. You can give them classes so they can get an advanced practice degree. You have to build them up. You have to put, put the work in and support them. Like, that's, that's really it, and it's really simple. We don't have to reinvent the wheel for this. But again, new grad nurses and all these nurses that are entering, they want their hand held, and we have to give them that support. We have to give them that attention, and we have to garner them and make sure that we're supporting them and knowing what their intrinsic motivation is. Because everybody's just not here for a dollar, and I really do want to debunk that, hmm. because nurses are here to care. And for us, our company, Compassionate Solutions, healers need help too. 
at the end of the day. And that's what we're here for. That's why we're here to support them. We are clinical professionals. We still are working in the field right now, in jobs right now. I'm in a leadership management job right now. So again, like we're still here at the front lines being there with them. But they have a, they have a voice and we have to advocate for them and be that voice for them. But definitely bringing international nurses here, that is a great succession plan for any healthcare facility or hospital because at least you can lock them in for three years. You can build them up so that they can really stay with you. And you have to be strategic about that. You have to talk to them. You have to get to know them. You have to build a community for them. That is how you support that. And that's how you, um, that's how you close that gap. Absolutely. And one of the things that I want to address, because I think all of you have drifted into the marketing room to, to learn something about marketing. <laughs> And one of the things I learned yesterday in working, uh, marketing to the Generation Z, mm. and I sometimes feel like as a nursing leader, I'm marketing to my staff. <laughs> I'm, I'm spending time with them as people mm -hmm. to um, understand what I can do for them to keep them in their role as mm -hmm. a staff nurse. Mm -hmm. And what, something that you said really reminded me of something that I heard in Marketing 2.0 yesterday that I wasn't aware of, because I'm, a, I'm above, way above the average age of a nurse. But um, these, the new grads coming in, Generation Z thinks we live in a perfect world. Yes. Because they were born in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. They haven't seen anything else except the pandemic of a perfect world. So as an employee, as, as a client in marketing, as an employee, they want to know how they can become a part of that perfect world mm -hmm. and help that perfect world from a social like you guys are saying, from a people and a society perspective. And I think those of us that are older in healthcare don't understand that concept because we know it is not a perfect world. So in order to retain the younger people coming into healthcare, we have to understand what motivates them. And it's not what motivates me. What motivates them is how can they improve on their perfect world and how can they shine a light in that world which is a totally different way of looking mm -hmm. at things we have seven minutes left so i want to go to questions and then i'm going to have each one of you wrap up the conversation do we have any questions from the audience about any of the gaps we've discussed or other gaps you'd like to hear from our panelists be my role to ask a question or make a comment. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, it's interesting in the development of, you know, the shortages in the, that you've talked about that none of you mentioned the federal program, the National Health Service Corps, which I'm very proud to have invented the idea in 1968, but it places nurses, physicians, and other people in medically underserved areas. They offer loan repayment for people who are members of minorities. They offer scholarships. This program's been around for 50 years. It serves 27 million Americans a year. Mm -hmm. And yet, you sit in a center like this and you're all here talking about basically wringing your hands and nobody mentions that this program exists. So could you, could you state the name gap. of the program so everyone in the audience can hear it? Because I'm not aware of it. National Health Service Corps. It's National Health by, Service Corps. Yeah, Health Service Corps. It's administered by HRSA and as part of the Bureau of Health Professions. And then um, the other thing that, you know, we talked about, you know, bringing nurses from other countries, which may, or health personnel, which may be desirable, but we have a tremendous pool of unused talent in our inner cities that we're not taking advantage of because we've not built the career ladders to move people through. There are programs, again, like this, which serve as models. The Skill Quest program organized by the Industrial Texas Industrial Areas Foundation, which um, takes people out who 
want to become nurses, as mm -hmm. an example, or mm -hmm. computer technicians, offers them the wraparound services mm -hmm. so that they get the, the daycare for their families mm -hmm. so they can go and they have partnerships with the community colleges. Mm -hmm. you, have, you talk about the turnover. Mm -hmm. At one year, they have a 95% retention rate. Wow. This is a program that keeps people. Mm -hmm. uh, the model functions in San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin now. It ought to be a national model. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate that information, and I think all the healthcare organizations in the world need that information. And yeah. I, I have someone's going to hit on that website in a minute. Yeah, definitely. And I'd never heard of the first program that you mentioned. But yes, I did actually mention that um, we, we need more of those bridge programs to go into high schools because we have the cosmetology. We have what the wood making class. Yeah. We have a lot of those programs, but a lot of them we don't have like CNA or MA programs that can bridge them in. Another thing that um, myself and Dr. Jackie talked about, we talked about um, the magnet program. You know, magnet programs for hospitals, you cannot have associate nurses. Why can't we change that? Why can't we bring associate nurses back, help them get their bachelor's degree, or at least in, that, in their studies, when they're um, working, we can give them the classes. Our educators, a lot of our educators are masters in doctor prepared nurses. Look at you, you know? So they can give them that education. They can give them that talent so that we're not just poaching or whatever or bringing our international nurses, but we also have to make sure that we are going into the communities and helping them develop that passion because it doesn't really look very um, nice right now to be a nurse. So, you know, we have to make sure that we're being intentional going into this, those communities. So, yes, I agree. Thank sure. you, Michelle. Next question. Yeah, this is more of a comment, I think, uh, than a question. I think one of the things I think people need to be careful of is um, everybody sort of has a tendency to demonize, if you will, the managed care companies that are paying for and then X, Y, and Z. And it's very easy to demonize them, but if you ask employers, um, do you think that health insurance cost is pretty good? pretty reasonable. And they would say, no, it's out the roof. Why is that? Because they, uh, there's mandated benefits, and there's that benefit, and this benefit. And every time you keep adding more and more benefits, and you want the third party payers to pay for that, that makes the cost go up. So you can't just isolate it and just demonize them and say, those mean bad insurance companies, why aren't they paying for my new XYZ therapeutic intervention? Well, if you ever ran an HMO, and I, I take it none of you guys have, I have, uh, when you run an HMO, the number of people that come to you that say, hey, I have a new intervention, and it's the best thing since sliced bread, and if you just cover it at this amount, it'd be great. And it, it's a little bit more complicated than just saying, why don't they adopt this, that, or the other thing? And I think the gentleman uh, over here mentioned that, you know, you, you talked about the 15% efficacy in terms of the recidivism in terms of these things. It's okay to look at things short term, but you're right on the money that sometimes the studies aren't fully developed or only half-baked. And as a data scientist, I can assure you, I've looked at lots of studies that if, uh, if you would have been my student and you brought me the study, <laughs> you would have gotten an F plus, because you know, at least you made a little effort. But, uh, but they're not worth the paper that they were quote unquote written on. So my only, my only advice and counsel is that if you really do have something good, the managed care companies are interested and they would be happy to hear you, but, uh, but you have to have more than just an anecdotal evidence. You need to have studies, you need to maybe even take a look at it long term. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there is a process and, and they're, they're, they're happy to look at things that improve the health and the cost of their membership as well as the cost of the membership if it truly does what it says it does. So just FYI. Thank you. We have a minute and a half left and Dr. Williams, I'm gonna let you address his statement and question. <clears throat> well, therein is a, is a, a loss in communication. Mm -hmm. We've never had that kind of gap closed in terms of what they look at and what we look at. What we look at is what we do. Uh, you don't have too much time to look beyond that, unfortunately. So when we move forward, we have to move forward in the best interest, primarily I speak of, of our children. Start from the bottom and work up. I see a lot of brain injury based on the impact forces that they've sustained. We also have a product that they wear during their, act <clears throat> their activities that prevent that lower jaw from slamming. It minimizes the possibility of brain injury and the future of damage, which you see a lot of, and you've probably never thought about, how did this guy get on this opiate? 
Okay, now we've got to go back and look at the groundswell of what it really means to our future. Concussions happen to be the crisis of the world. It's just not a U.S. problem, it's a crisis of the world. And we have to address it as such. So, those folks that want to know how to prevent it and how to heal it, I'm here for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Tinwer, what, um, how do you think is one of the best ways we can address and close this gap in the future? So, I just want to say two things. One is uh, my, our doctors are suffering from decision fatigue <laughs> because they have to take a, a colossal critical clinical decisions every single day. So we need to take off the administrative burden out of them. And on top of that, if we can implement CDSS, the clinical decision support system, I think that will significantly help them to reduce the human errors. Thank you. Lance? I just, the gentleman, he made a comment. And one of the main things in my company is let's start a new conversation. You know, I mean, I don't know insurance. I'm not an insurance salesman or an insurance company. Really don't want to be. Um, that's a job that's better suited for them. But for me, I'm on the ground and I've read studies and I have did a lot of research and I see the impact on the ground in person. And I don't care who I have to talk to, but let's at least start a new conversation as a community of how to do better work. And if we do better work, we're going to lower costs and everybody wins, including the client. But if it's about costs and about that kind of a dialogue, the client will always lose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michelle, any last comments? I think my last comment is basically like just to continue to have these type of conversations. Yeah. I think um, they open up your mind. Um, that insurance thing, um, that comment that he just made, never even thought about that, mm -hmm. but definitely I think that's a conversation to be had. Um, and I think that, um, of course, the session planning um, and supporting the varying generations that are in healthcare right now, because it's multiple generations. I mean, our baby boomers are leaving, but it's still multiple generations within healthcare right now. So we have to find a way to support them all. Um, a lot of our baby boomers, they kind of want to work per diem life. Let them work per diem life. They want to be in control of their schedules, give them a scheduling committee so they can control it so we're ha having and we're holding accountability at its best. So I think that um, having the conversation, supporting our staff, and hearing and listening um, will definitely close the gap. Thank you very much. And thank you guys for listening to our very esteemed and distinguished um, team of panelists up here. I know all of them are on LinkedIn because that's how I found them, to reach out to them to talk about our conversation today. Jessica Grunler and Clinical Project Resource is also on LinkedIn. And I um, would encourage you to reach out to these people to keep this conversation going. And I really encourage everybody to come back next year so we can have continue these conversations and change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.